it without your help, and they can't solve it without God's help. We're going to have to turn to God. We've turned everywhere else, and we've failed. Now let's turn to God. Some churches and synagogues, as they ponder the agonizing needs of the people, have abandoned the proclamation of our relationship with God or with Christ, and we've adopted instead a political and social agenda which, if out of balance, can leave both souls and pews empty. Everybody I talk to, it seems, agrees that New York is the loneliest place in the world. And people get increasingly irritable and pushy in their effort to guard their own turf. There's little space for others, let alone God. To be without God in New York is to be terribly lonely, and this leads to a feeling that life is futile. A few weeks ago, the New York Times stated that the bestseller of its class was Derek Humphrey's Final Exit, a manual on how to commit suicide. Is that the way to terminate your life? Suicide? Many people want to turn their backs on New York. They see New York City's problems as incurable. I think we ought to stay in New York and let's do something about it to change New York. And I believe we can do it. And if New York were changed, it would touch London and Paris and all the other great cities of the world. I don't see that way, that way with, about New York. God loves New York, and he has not given up on this city because he does not give up on people. As big and grand as New York buildings are, they are not New York. As wide and famous as New York City avenues are, they are not New York. As great as the plays and musicals and art and concerts are, they are not New York. New Yorkers are what make up New York. New York is a place where people live, and it's the people that God is interested in. And I'm going to speak on what I believe is the answer to the problems of your problems and the problems of New York. There is a better way. I'm going to make my message today short, and I know that'll please you. I never did like to hear long sermons, and I still like to hear short ones. I heard about a man one time that was introduced to speak for 20 minutes, and he spoke for an hour and 10 minutes, and he was still speaking. And the man that introduced him threw a gavel in it missed him and hit a woman on the front row. And she said, hit me again, I can still hear him. <laughs> and I don't want that to happen to me today. I want you to turn with me to the 16th verse of the third chapter of John. John, the third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many of us can say it together? Let's try all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that is the gospel in a nutshell. That's a miniature Bible. Everything you need to know about redemption and salvation is in that one verse of Scripture. Twenty-five wonderful words that my mother taught me when she was giving me a bath on a Saturday night on a farm in North Carolina. She said, I want you to learn this passage from the Bible. And she taught me that passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many people ask me, well, if God loves the world, why does he allow so much suffering in the world? War, disease, poverty, hate, loneliness, boredom, emptiness, psychological problems, unemployment, violence, tension, all of these things. Why doesn't God just come and stop it all? That's the question many people are asking. Some people here in New York are saying, I can't take it anymore, and they're committing suicide. The pressures of life are too great. They can't take it. Why? If there is a God, why doesn't he end it? Some people say, why has God abandoned us? But God has not abandoned us. We've abandoned him. Many of you young people here have heard the song on last year's Edge of the Century album by Styx. However, did you ever listen to the words, the lyrics? Here are the lyrics. Listen. Every night I say a prayer in the hopes that there's a heaven but every day I'm more confused 
are the saints turn into sinners. All the heroes and legends I knew as a child have fallen as idols of clay, and I feel this empty place inside so afraid that I've lost my faith. Show me the way. Show me the way. Bring me tonight to the mountain and take my confusion away and show me the way. And if I see a light, should I believe? Tell me how I will know. Show me the way. Show me the way. Take me tonight to the river and wash my illusions away. Show me the way. Show me the way. Give me the strength and the courage to believe that I'll get there someday and please show me the way. And every night I say a prayer in the hopes that there's a heaven. And this passage says, for God, for God. Do you believe in God? Yes. I can't prove God. I can't take you to a scientific laboratory and prove to you that there is a God. But the Bible teaches us about him. He is the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All those stars at night that you see, if you can see them in New York, God created them and started them. He is also a spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He doesn't have a body like you and I. He could only be one place at one time if he had a body like yours. But God is a spirit. He can be everywhere at the same time. He can be in Russia. He can be in China. He can be in America. He can be in Africa. He can be in Latin America. He can be everywhere at the same time. God is also unchanging. I am the Lord God. I change not, says the Bible. In him is no variables, neither shadow of turning, says James. The Bible says that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Think of it. He's appointed a day, a moment, in which he's going to judge the world, and you'll be there. God, but God also is a God of love. My mother loved me, but she didn't love me near as much as God loves me, and that seems impossible to believe. My wife loves me. I love her. I have five children. I love them. I have 19 grandchildren. I love them, and I hope they love me. I have three great-grandchildren. I think they love me, and I love them, and I know that they all love the Lord. But nothing is to be compared to the love of God. They had to invent a whole new word in the Greek language to tell us something about the love of God. God is a God of love. He loves you. And if there's one thing I want you to take from this great park when you leave here today, it's this. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And God is interested in you. And he has the hairs of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He knows all about you and he loves you. No matter how many sins you've committed or whatever you've done, you may have gone as low as Nicky Cruz described a moment ago his life was, but God loves you. And if God could change Nicky Cruz and change Johnny Cash, God can change you if you will let him. And he can do it today, beginning right now. Yes, God is a God of judgment. He'll bring every work into judgment, and he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world. But God is also the God of love. Nothing compared to the love of God. The Bible says God is love. Yea, I have loved thee with a love that's everlasting, says Jeremiah. And for this reason, God created man. Have you ever wondered why you're here? Why God created the human race? And what's the purpose of the human race? God created you because he's a God of love. And he wanted some other creatures in the universe that could choose to love him in return. And so he created man, Adam and Eve. He put them in a perfect paradise. And we believe that that was located in the country that's now called Iraq, at the head of the Persian Gulf. Much of the Bible was written in Iraq, Nineveh, Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees where Abraham came from. And Abraham is the father of the Jews and the Christians and the Islamic people. Abraham is the one we all look to as the beginning. He came from Iraq. And that's the reason there was so much interest in Iraq during the Gulf War. That's why the, so many books were written from the Bible about the Gulf. 
And God created man and put him in that garden of Eden, that perfect environment, that perfect paradise. And God gave man a choice. And God said, I, can, I want you to have all the fruit of the garden except one tree. You can't eat of that one tree. God was testing man. And God said, if you eat of that tree, you are going to break my law, you're going to suffer, and you're going to die. And man broke God's law. God gave him a free will to choose, and man chose to rebel against God. I heard a TV talk show the other day. You can listen to nearly all of them, and they're discussing what's wrong with human nature. Why do people do the things they do? Why do people commit the crimes they do? Why do people tell the lies they tell? Why is there so much jealousy? Why are there so many problems in the world? It's because man has a disease, and the disease is called sin. What's the basic cause of war and crime and deceit and fraud? Why do we have to have hospitals and jails with bars and windows and police forces and military forces? Our social problems are basically moral and spiritual problems, and the moral problems require a religious solution. All these problems indicate that something is wrong with human nature. People have been looking to technology or political force to save us. But God says, your problem is in your hearts. The first sin ever committed was committed in a paradise. It's a heart problem. Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and blasphemy. The Bible says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. The Bible says sin is a breaking of the law. What law? The law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience? Then you've committed a sin. Have you ever broken one of the Ten Commandments? Then you're a sinner. Have you ever failed to keep the requirements of the so Sermon on the Mount? Then you're a sinner. We've come short of what God requires. And we're sinners before God. And sin comes between you and God and comes between you and peace, between you and happiness, between you and joy, and between you and the assurance that if you died, you're going to heaven. Solomon, the great king of Israel, once said, there is no man that sinneth not. We are alienated from God. Let's remember that. We are separated from God, but in spite of that, he still loves us. Yes, there is a hell. There's a hell in this life, but there's also a hell in the life to come if we keep, if we are separated from God. The Bible teaches that death has three dimensions. There's natural death. When you die, you're going to be buried or you're going to be cremated or however you're, they're going to handle you. We disappear from this earth. But there's also spiritual death. Living inside of you as your soul or your spirit. That's the part of you that lives forever. That's the part of you that can have fellowship with God. And you have broken God's law, and as a result of it, you're spiritually dead. You're dead toward God. And that death will continue throughout eternity after you're dead. And you're not going to be out there with thousands of people having a good time, as many people describe hell. You're going to be all alone. You're going to be, there'll be a terrible loneliness to it all. And that's what hell is. And we can have hell in this life and hell in the life to come. And that's called eternal death. Words in the New Testament used by Christ to describe the penalty of sin is lost, perish, condemned, punishment, hell. God saw all this confusion and saw us stumbling in darkness. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were either bored on the one hand or we were physically dying on the other. So God decided to do something about it because of his love. God couldn't just forgive us or he would break his own word. He wouldn't be God. He had said that if you sin, you're going to die. If you sin, you're going to suffer. We had to suffer. We had to die so God's word could be kept. One day I was walking with one of my sons along a road in North Carolina. We stepped on an anthill and we looked down and we saw those ants dying and suffering and saw their little house destroyed, and my son said to me, Dad, wouldn't it be great if we could uh, help those ants rebuild our house, take them to their hospitals? I said, yes, but we're too big and they're too little. Then I thought, what a wonderful illustration. God looked down from heaven and saw us with all of our darkness, with all of our stumbling and all of our 
problems and fightings and bickerings and difficulties and wars. But God was too big. We were too small. We looked like little ants crawling on this planet. What could God do? God decided to do something about it. God became a man. God became a man. And that man was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and he came for one purpose. He came to save you and to save me and to save the world. And he came to die. He's the only man that was ever born just for the purpose of dying. He took our sins on the cross. They took him outside of Jerusalem and nailed him. The Romans did, not the Jews. The Romans took him outside the walls of Jerusalem and nailed him on a cross and he shed his blood and in that terrible moment when he was hanging there he said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and in that terrible moment he made seven agonizing expressions and in those expressions he was telling us that he had taken our sins he was made to be sin for us think of it he was made to be sin he became guilty of your adultery he became guilty of all the sex sins that you've committed. He became guilty of all the envy and the jealousy and the fighting and the killing and the murders that you read about in the newspapers almost every day. He hath made him to be sin for us. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think of it. He took our sins. Now what do we have to do? We have to repent of our sins. All through the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets said, Repent. The first sermon Jesus ever preached was, Repent. And all through the New Testament, they wrote, Repent, 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 repent. What does the word repentance mean? It means that you confess to God, I have sinned against you, Lord. I'll admit it. It means that you turn from your sins. You're willing to let God have his way in your life and you're ready to follow him and serve him from now on. That's repentance. A few days ago, in our daily bread entitled, Take Me to the Cross, Cliff Barris gave me this wonderful little story. A policeman, an officer, was patrolling on night duty in a town in northern Great Britain when he heard a quivering sob. He saw a little boy in the shadows sitting on a doorstep, tears rolling down his cheeks. The child said, I'm lost. Please take me home. The policeman began naming street after street, trying to help the boy remember where he lived. He named the shops and the hotels in the area, but all without success. Then he remembered. In the center of the town was a church with a large white cross towering high above the surrounding city. He pointed to it and said, Do you live anywhere near that? The boy's face immediately brightened. Yes, sir. Take me to the cross. I can find my way home from there. And if you come to the cross today, there is a way if you come by the way of the cross. If you're lost, the only way home is to come to the cross. The cross of Christ directs lost people to their eternal home. But Jesus didn't stay on a cross. He rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. And I'm not speaking to you about a dead Christ. I'm speaking to you about a living Christ. And this living Christ is going to, can come into your heart today by the Holy Spirit and make you a new person, give you a new outlook on life. Take away that loneliness. Take away all those sins that you've committed and wipe them away so that when God sees you, he never sees your sins. You are justified in his sight as though you'd never sinned. And then the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back again someday. I was in Jerusalem, and I was talking one day to the chief rabbi. And I asked him, I said, Sir, do you believe that Messiah is coming back? He said, Oh, yes. I said, I do too. But I said, I believe when he comes, you're going to notice that he's Jesus Christ. He laughed for a moment over his cup of coffee, and he said, he didn't laugh, he just smiled. He said, of course, that's our difference. We're both looking for Messiah, but we believe that it's going to be Jesus Christ. 
and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory with power and great glory. He's coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom. Yes, communism did not win. No ism is going to win. Only Christ is going to win. And someday, someday he's going to rule the world. But tonight he wants to rule your heart. He wants to come into your home, into your family, into your neighborhood. He wants to come into our country. And he wants to be king of kings and lord of lords. Now what does God require of you? I've already told you about one thing, repentance. During this past week, we've been celebrating the holiest days of the Jewish year. Yom Kippur, which is celebrated on Wednesday, is intensely personal. The Jewish holidays ask three questions. What have we done, our li what have we done with our life during the past year? Where are we now in our life? What do we plan to do with our life in the coming year? And one reason that Yom Kippur exercises such an enormous grip upon the Jewish people is because the holiday theme is so personal and contemporary. There's not a person among the people that can say, my life is complete and spiritually filled. We all fall short. And we have to say with everyone else, I too am a sinner. I'm separated from God. I'm lost. I need to find my way home. It's not an option. It's a command. In Acts 17, the apostle in his sermon says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Think of it. God commands it. It's a command for you to repent. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? If you haven't repented of your sins, you'll never see the inside of the kingdom of heaven. And then you come by faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll never be able to work your way to heaven. You have to come by faith in Christ. And you come by the grace of God. Grace means it's something you don't deserve. You can't work for. You come by faith in Him. That's how I came. By simple childlike faith. You say, Billy, those are such simple things. that Jesus spoke with such simplicity about spiritual things that the children heard Him gladly. And we're, we're to make it simple. It's a profound truth, but it's to be proclaimed in simplicity. And all of you today that are willing to say, I will repent of my sins, I receive Christ as Savior, I want to follow Him and serve Him, or I want to rededicate myself. You might want to renew your vows that you took at confirmation or at baptism or whenever it was. And you want to say, Lord, I want to come back to you. I've wandered away from you and I've gotten confused and lost. And I want Christ to be first in my life. I want him to forgive my sins. I want to come to the cross. And I want to follow him from now on. Hold up your hand. Yes, there are many people with hands up. And there are so many people standing. I can't ask you to stand because you wouldn't stand out. And there are four things from now on that are very important. First, Read the Bible every day. The Bible is food for your soul. Secondly, pray. Perhaps you cannot pray like a clergyman, but you can say, Lord, help me. I'm in need of help. He'll come and help you. He'll answer your prayer. Pray it in Christ's name. Say, Lord Jesus, I, I need you. And then the third thing, witness for Christ. You ought to tell some people when you go home tonight or tell people tomorrow, you know, at that great lawn meeting, I made a commitment to Christ and I mean to keep it with God's help. That'll help you to win other people to Christ. And then the fourth thing is get into the church. Into a church where Christ is proclaimed and follow him and serve him as best you can because you see when you leave here you won't leave alone the Spirit of God goes with you and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me pray it out loud oh God I am a sinner I'm sorry for my sin I'm willing to turn from my sin I receive Christ as Savior 
I confess him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. You can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, the 102nd Psalm, and beginning with verse 5, well, say just 6. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Today, I went for a few minutes out into the foothills and took a little walk down a little road. I didn't want to go too far because they told me there were rattlesnakes around there. I'm not a friend of rattlesnakes for some reason. No, they're not my friend. We have a lot of them where I live, so we have experience with them. I let my wife kill those. <laughs> and she does. She's not afraid of, well, she's not afraid of anything that I ever heard of. But she's certainly not afraid of snakes. She was born and reared in China, a in a town that she said she never went to sleep a single night that she didn't hear gunshots. And so she learned not to be afraid because she's never saw fear in her father and mother because the town would change hands every once in a while as bandits or warlords would come in and then finally the Japanese came and my father-in-law had a big hospital and he lived through all that and she was there 17 years. But I want to say that today as I walked out on that little place, I began to think and meditate a little bit. And I watched a bird. I don't know the name of that bird. It's a big bird and it has different colors. I, it may be a magpie, I'm not sure, but it certainly has a strange sound to North Carolina ears. And then the bird sat on a fence post and he sat there by himself. No mate came around. Now we have a lot of doves where I live and as you know, they mate for life and they would go around together and they have friendship and fellowship and uh, produce little children, little birds. <laughs> and, uh, but this bird today seemed to be all alone and I thought about this passage of scripture that's found in the 101st of 102nd Psalm. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch in him as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, tonight, there are many lonely people here, many single people in the city of Denver. 51% of your population is single. And many of those people are lonely. And one of the supreme problems of modern society is loneliness. The modern city is a lonely place. Here in America, 70% more people are living alone in one-person dwellings than 10 years ago. A New York psychiatrist was quoted the other day as saying, New York City is the loneliest place in the world for millions. What would you say about Denver or the town you come from? An American university study reported that university students are the loneliest people in the United States followed by divorced people. Are you lonely? One of the principal causes of loneliness is alcoholism and drug use. Alcohol and drugs are efforts to escape loneliness. Drugs take you on a trip and being drunk makes you feel that you've got somebody with you. On the other hand, going with Christ is a trip in which you really always have Jesus with you as your Lord and companion. You cannot drink your way out of loneliness. 
Most young people turn to drugs for kicks and get hooked or peer pressure, but thousands turn to drugs because of loneliness. A magazine cover story recently had our neglected youth. It said that actually most of them are properly clothed and fed, but something is missing in the lives of millions. It's a neglect of the spirit, the article said, which leaves them lonely and prone to drugs and alcohol, but all too often leads to suicide. What can be done about it? One of the key words in the Bible is communion, from which we get our word communication. Jesus came to a man one time that was lonely and sick and paralyzed. 38 years he'd sat in the same spot, lonely and tired without a friend. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you need a friend? And he said, yes. This bundle of loneliness and human pain had been buffeted by the surging tides of thousands of people. But Jesus singled him out. He became his friend that day and he healed him. He can become your friend tonight if you'll let him. Loneliness began actually in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect paradise, when man and woman declared their independence of God. They said, we don't need you, God. We can build this world without you. So they made a terrible choice. They chose to turn away from God. They went their own way, tried to build their world, and sin entered at that beautiful garden. And it was given to the next generation, the next generation, the next, the next, down to you and me. And we all have the disease, and it's a fatal disease. Nobody ever escapes the judgment of the disease of sin. So you, the roots of loneliness were planted in the human soul and we, has been inherited by every inhabitant ever. Because you see, in that garden, God went looking for Adam. He knew where he was, but he went looking for him. He wanted Adam to know where he was. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam tried to hide got some fig leaves and sewed them on. He didn't know he was naked till then. But he couldn't hide. Loneliness has never been a respect of persons. The world's greatest artists, writers and composers, kings and queens and carpenters and plumbers and everybody have felt this terrible thing called loneliness. In John 13, it tells about the Last Supper and it tells about the betrayal of Judas. And the scripture says he went out and it was night. No one ever went away from Jesus but what it was night. Perhaps there was a time that you knew the fellowship of God's people and you had peace with God. But you've backslidden, you've gone away, you've turned away. You've fallen aside. There was a time when you knew Christ. You felt you knew him. There was a time when you felt you meant business with God, but now your heart has grown cold and hard towards spiritual things. You've been pulled away by others and other things and other gods and other pleasures that you know to be wrong. And you went out from the presence of God and you have found that it's night out there. You don't have fellowship with true believers and you don't feel really at home in the world you're living in. And certainly you no longer have fellowship with Christ. And there's no loneliness quite so bitter as the loneliness of a backslidden Christian who claims with his mouth that he knows Christ, but deep in his heart he knows he doesn't. How many of you are straddling the fence, trying to put one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom? Sin makes us lonely because it separates us from God. And it was never in God's intention for you to be lonely. Hundreds of surveys prove that our society has not made us a better adjusted or happier society. Oh yes, we can have fleeting moments of sensual satisfaction, create a bitterness and a loss of sense of pleasure that no psychiatrist can cure. The Bible says that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and dirt. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman on the, at the well? 
She was a lonely woman. She had several husbands, had had several husbands, no satisfaction, no peace, no joy. Jesus came and talked to her, forgave her her sins, transformed her life, made her a new person. She went into the village of Sychar and told all the people that here was someone that knows all about you. Come and see him. And they all went out to see Jesus. The Bible says he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Even though great crowds surrounded him, at times he was alone. Even at the end, the scripture says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowds who shouted one day, Hosanna. That same week, five days later, they were crucifying him. And at last we hear from the cross, Jesus on the cross dying for you and for me. God laying on him all of our sins and our judgment and our hell, which he took on that cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, something mysterious happened. No theologian can explain it. Jesus took your sins, your judgment, your hell. All the penalty that I deserve for my sins, he took on that cross. And it was a lonely moment, a lonely period when he alone had to bear the cross and he became guilty of all the sins of the whole world. He experienced ultimate loneliness as he died for you and died for me. I've never understood how a person can turn away from Jesus when they actually see him on that cross. Dying for you and to reject him, to turn away when he offers you forgiveness, he offers you a new life, he offers you peace and joy and friendship, never to be lonely again. Through his death, Christ dealt with the primary cause of human loneliness, separation from God, because hell essentially is separation from God. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. Jesus suffered its agonies for you. Jesus was lonely for you. I remember when my grandmother died, I had the privilege of being there at that time. She sat up in bed with a smile and a glow on her face. Her husband had been wounded at Gettysburg, lost an eye, lost a leg at Gettysburg. And she sat up and she said, I see Ben, her husband, who had died some years earlier. And she said, oh, the music is so beautiful. And then she fell back on the pillow out in eternity. I remember when my mother was dying a relatively short time ago and all the wonderful sayings that she left behind on her deathbed because she just lived only for the Lord. She had a joy and a peace. You never went into her room that you didn't come out and feel that she was ministering to you. You didn't minister to her. And even when she was in a coma, she woke up one night and quoted scripture and the nurse said she never saw such a look on anybody's face and fell back into her coma and went into eternity. There's a great difference even in the last hour between those who know Christ and those who don't know him. Then there's the loneliness of your decision. Because you see, Christ died for you he rose again. He's living. He wants to come into your heart. He offers you forgiveness and salvation and assurance and peace and joy. And he offers you a tough life. I'm not going to play games with you and tell you that it's easy to follow Christ. It's not. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross and follow me, you can't, follow, you can't be my disciple. Now, the cross was a place where they executed criminals. It would be like today, he said, take up the electric chair and follow me. He said, I'm going to suffer. 
I'm going to die. And he said, if you follow me, he said, you're going to have troubles and difficulties and problems and persecution and maybe death. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go all the way with me to the cross? Oh, yes, in the midst of it, there'll be his peace and his joy and his friendship and his forgiveness and his promise and the hope that he offers for the future. But there will also be the possibility of persecution and suffering and problems that you never dreamed of when you come to Christ. We've been in those parts of the world where people suffer because they come to Christ. You must make the decision about Christ yourself. Our reaction to loneliness is often to deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We get involved in pleasures, parties, good times, sex. We get involved in our work. We throw ourselves into the social world at the school. We read one of the best-selling books which urges us to take control of our lives. Any attempt to deal with sin without conversion is like struggling in quicksand. And how many young people today and older people are struggling in quicksand, trying to save yourself, but you can't. You've come to the end of your rope. Turn your life over to Christ. Let Him bear your burdens. Help you solve your problems. Help direct and lead you in your life. How many young people here tonight do not really know what you want to do with your life? Or help you in your marriage, who you ought to marry. There's a lady talked to me tonight who said she's just waiting for the right man to come along. And there are many like that. Be sure it's God's man, a God's woman. I remember I took my three daughters aside when they were, oh, they couldn't have been more than eight, nine, or ten years of age. And I said, let's stop here in the mountain and pray for your husbands who you're going to marry, they're boys somewhere, and let's just pray that God will lead them and lead you and that they will be men of God. Well, they looked at me as though their dad had gone crazy. <laughs> but we prayed, and they got the right men too. One of them's here tonight. And we prayed the same way for our sons. Both, for the first time in many, several years at least, both of my sons are here tonight. I don't know where they are, but they're here somewhere. But you have to make this decision alone. If we search for an antidote to loneliness and drugs and alcohol and sex and encounter groups and psychological experiences, often it all only serves to mire us deeper in despair without a remedy. Through Jesus Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The psalmist that wrote that about the pelican and the owl said, Oh, my soul, why be so gloomy and discouraged? Trust in God. I shall again praise him for his wondrous help. He will make me smile again, for he is my God. Loneliness is often God's way of letting us know it is time to reach out, reach out to the cross, and you'll never be lonely again. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter which said, quote, about a month ago, my wife and I separated. She moved out of our house saying that she could not stand to be around me anymore. We'd gotten to a point where we could not communicate with each other anymore. We were throwing accusations, some founded and some not, and bitter, spiteful words at each other. So she moved out and went to live with another man until she could get an apartment of her own. On June the 8th this year, I had come home from work, and after dinner I felt a compulsion to turn on the tube. I attribute it to the loneliness and frustration I was feeling. Sometimes the tube can be an excellent fire escape for a short while but it's not a good fire extinguisher, he said. Anyway, I turned the set on and randomly flipped the dial 
the station I had chosen was just announcing the beginning of the Billy Graham crusade from South Carolina. I don't mind telling you, I was more than a little skeptical about televised religious programs, but I continued to watch. At the end of your sermon, which I felt was directed at me and my situation, when you called those people who wanted to change the direction of their lives to come forward and receive Christ as their Savior, I hesitated, but then I did. At this time, my wife and I are starting to put things back on track. Another one. Last night, I preached on John 3, 16. And the people here said it all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And last night, more than 1,700 people came and made their commitment to Christ. A few weeks ago, no, no. A few weeks ago, in one of our crusades, a man looked at that same verse, and the counselor told him, you can put your name in that verse. You are the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, put your name there, whosoever believeth or commit his life to him will never perish but have everlasting life. And then he had a grin on his face and he said, I like that. You can put your name tonight in that same way as all of those did last night. God so loved the world for you that he gave his son. And you put your name and say, Lord, I open my heart and my life to you. I commit myself to you. For some of you, it may be that you're going to recommit your life. For others, you're going to make a brand new start. You want to be sure how you stand before God tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we saw those people do last night. We've seen people in every continent of the world do. And more than three score countries, we've seen people do what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and say tonight, I want to serve Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to receive Christ. I want to come to the cross. I want to put my confidence and my trust in Him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that Christ lives in my heart. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because Jesus, every person Jesus called, He called publicly. And He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and taking a stand in public that makes it count. I'm going to ask you, if you come from that gallery up on top, it's going to take you two or three minutes, so start now. And I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium, please. This is the holy moment. And God is speaking to you wherever you are. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'll say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. Or you can bring your friend with you, but just get up and come quickly, hundreds of you. Back over here, over there, upstairs. You may be in the choir and God has spoken to you even though you're in the choir. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be a leader in your church, but God has spoken to you about your need of Christ. You get up and come. Over here on the ends, everywhere, quickly. that have been watching by television, you can make this same commitment tonight. And whether you're in, at home or in a bar or in a hotel room, you can have that knowledge that your sins are forgiven, that you're justified. And the word justified means just as though you had never sinned in your life. That's how God looks at you through the blood of Christ. He will come into your heart where you are. And if you'll make that commitment, pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on your screen. May God help you to make that commitment that so many hundreds here in Colorado are making on this beautiful Colorado evening. God bless you.